right. Welcome back, everybody. And um, 2020, as you may know by now, has been quite a bit of a bumper year for blockchain, if I may say so. Um, just listen to all the conversations that's been happening, you know, the ones that Blockstream have hosted before, or even earlier in the day as well, where you had conversations with the Winklevoss twins, um, not just talking about blockchain, but cryptocurrencies as well, right? Um, in the public blockchain sector, though, the DeFi bloom has created new opportunities and renewed interest in the space. Uh, while in enterprise blockchain, uh, various high-profile projects hint, hint something that uh, our MAS MD Ravi Menon briefly touched on uh, at 2 p.m. Singapore time earlier in the day. Read the news. And um, you know, projects are actually going live or commercialized for the very first time. Um, actually, announcements about this, you know, like pilot projects, research, R&D, and all of that have actually been going on way back since 2016 slash 2017. Now, the question here is, what is the immediate and long-term gain for the blockchain space? To share more, we have uh, Takis of JP Morgan and Onyx um, to join us. Joining him and actually doing the discussion with him is Ju uh, from NASDAQ. She's also the lady that's doing trade talks. If you go to the platform, you will find NASDAQ. And under NASDAQ, you've got trade talks. Trade talks are like five, seven-minute sessions, essentially quick-fire interviews, very good snippets. You know, how is it with all of us online nowadays? We've got extremely short um, attention span. So five, seven minutes is perfect. Um, what's going to be happening in this discussion is they will essentially be looking back at blockchain in 2020 and what happens next. Now, this is going to be a very interesting discussion, especially for block show. The reason I say that is because most of the time, and you know, we, we do this every year, right? We always talk about blockchain, uh, blockchain 2018, blockchain 2019, blockchain 2020 this year. I think what makes this extremely interesting is that for the first time, we've got a representative from what we call big finance, a bank. Uh, that's having this. Traditionally, it's always somebody within the blockchain ecosystem, you know, for example, Binance or something like that, who would be having this conversation. Um, I think it's a very good representation for the industry and the progress from the innovation side of things of how we are progressing, that for the first time, we're actually having such a conversation uh, with Takis, right? And without further ado, don't want to hold everybody back. Um, I just want to now hand it over to Jill. Uh, Jill. Takis, thank you very much and glad you can join us. Take it away. All right, Gabe, thanks so much for having us this afternoon. And while we wish we were traditionally on the ground doing trade talks um, with everyone in Singapore, we're grateful to have the opportunity to do this virtually. And that certainly lends to the technology that we've made those investments in to connect us globally across multiple time zones. And with that, let, let's talk more about the technology behind blockchain and cryptocurrency. And, and talk us, I'd like to understand the history first. Um, JP Morgan originally looked at Bitcoin and crypto in general with some suspicion, but that stance has really softened as we've seen this year. The cause of this is definitely not sudden, but based on much internal research and study the landscape. What guided this process to where we are today? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Jill, for the question. First of all, hello to everyone. And like Jill, I'm sorry we cannot uh, be in Singapore in person to do all of that, maybe next year. Uh, I, I think to, to answer your question, I, I think when we think about kind of the broader crypto space, we like to think of it in three categories. The first category is Bitcoin and all of the other currencies that are not based on any fiat currency. And that I see as an investment option. And, you know, we've seen projections on the future value of Bitcoin anywhere from zero to a million. And today we're at 20,000 and who knows where it's going to be. In my business, which is money movement, transaction banking, treasury services, we don't get um, into investment options and therefore... I, my business has no, no interest in Bitcoin as an investment. That said, what has happened over the past few years is that there are a number of exchanges that are regulated, that have great KYC and AML programs, and with those, we have no problem doing business and we are supporting some of the largest ones. The second area is the area of uh, crypto that is pegged to an individual currency, whether it is created by companies like the JP Morgan coin or it's created by central bank. And as you know, there is a lot of conversation and a lot of ongoing dialogue around that. That I see as an alternative method of payment 
as an alternative that we in my business, which moves $7 trillion a day around the world, we need to support, we should support, and we should have our own, uh, our own crypto coin as, as part of that equation. And then third is blockchain technology, about which we were very excited from day one. And we have been investing quite a lot uh, because we see blockchain technology as quite interesting for a number of applications, especially around things that have to do uh, with information exchange, secure document management, and any place in which a number of um, institutions want to exchange information without a central exchange. That's why we set up what we used to call IIN and now we call LINK, which is a blockchain network that brings 400 banks together. It may or may not move money, but even the ability to move information among these 400 banks we think is quite valuable. So I would say in terms of softening our stance, this only applies to the first one, to the like Bitcoin type of uh, crypto. Uh, and the main thing that changed is that there are now exchanges which are well regulated, well controlled, and we feel comfortable doing business with. JP Morgan has been a key partner to the project. You've been in project. You've been may have been what inspired JP Morgan to launch Onyx Coin Systems. What drove this collaboration? How has it accelerated development within JP Morgan? So, uh, first of all, Project Ubin is a very very exciting project for us. Uh, because it's the first time that together with our partners, uh, Tamasek and DBS, and obviously in uh, close contact with uh, the MAS, we are thinking about how can you create a fully digital blockchain-based multi-currency clearing system. Such a thing does not exist anywhere in the world. And if successful, I think it can be a real game changer. We are going to have a modern network that's going to work 24 by 7, that's going to have multiple currencies, and that's going to have the ability to have uh, kind of digital currencies for each one of the currencies that will be part of the network. And it will allow us to do all of the cool things that blockchain and crypto technology allow you to do, like programmable money and so on, which are things that you can never do with regular cash. So for me, it's a great project. It's obviously a very complex one, and it's never been done anywhere in the world, and that's part of the reason why it's taking a long time so that we all get comfortable on how it's going to work. But if it does work, I think it's going to be a game changer. And it will start from Singapore, but we've all had conversations in other parts of the world. I think a lot of other countries are looking very carefully at what we are doing. And if it's successful, I think it's going to have, it's going to attract a lot of interest. And Takis, just to follow up what you just said, you're quoted on the Onyx page as follows. Onyx illustrates our commitment to blockchain and other groundbreaking technologies to strengthen and expand JP Morgan's wholesale payments platform. We are at the forefront of reimagining and re-architecting better ways to exchange information and value. So I have a couple of questions here. How does this work and when we will be able to see it in action? What, what makes this different from conventional forms of e-payments that already exist? Yeah. So first of all, in, in, uh, in our business in wholesale payments, as I mentioned before, we move $7 trillion every day. So we think we are very good at it. It works at scale. And 98% of the time, things are STP. They happen in seconds. The cost is minimal. So the, the system works. And we all know that because cross-border money movement works. That said, there are elements of, um, of that value chain which continue to be inefficient. And the way we've approached all of the use cases, including Ubin and several others that I'm going to talk about, is we say, how can we remove the inefficiency in the system? How can we take that 2%, uh, which is either because banks need to exchange information um, between each other or because of the multiple hops that it takes for money to go from the origin to the destination? How can we take those things and try to simplify them? So we have a number of initiatives that are in flight, all of which I find very exciting. First, we are live with our first client on using the JP Morgan coin to move money uh, cross-border. This is still a pilot. We still need to work out the kinks, but it is live, and we are very excited about that. Second, Project Tubin that we talked about. But then third, we looked at a couple of areas in uh, the money movement process that are highly inefficient. An example of that is account validation. 
if you are Amazon, if you are unfinancial, you send out millions of payments every day. And some of them you send out to beneficiaries for the first time. And what happens is the name could be wrong, the account number could be wrong, there could be uh, fraud in the account, etc. And what you want to see is, has any bank seen that account? So by using our link network, we can provide through an API the ability to check that before you send money and do that real time. That, for me, if we are able and we are working to launch that as an app on Link, I think would be a great benefit to money movement. Another example is um, this kind of esoteric and very old business in the U.S. called check processing. The rest of the world has moved away from checks, but as you know, in the U.S., 40% of the payments are still with checks. So it's great to talk about digital currencies and blockchain and all of that stuff, but 40% of the payments are still checks. Yet, we think blockchain, because of the secure information exchange that it provides, can allow us to link the banks that create the checks with the processors that handle those checks, put them all on a blockchain network so that the information changes hands digitally and no one any longer has to print a check, send the check, handle the check, etc. So that's another application. I know it sounds kind of old-fashioned, but it is. it can save hundreds of millions of dollars in the industry, and it's a great example of how you can bring the old and the new together uh, and create uh, value for the system. But just to give you a sense of perspective, in, in my business, we spend billions of dollars in technology. Uh, we launched Onyx as our R&D uh, part of that business. It has, you know, its own budget. It has its own P&L. And as these use cases uh, mature and, and become real products, we're hoping that that P&L will become larger and larger. And at some point, it will disrupt the regular way in which we do business. I think we are still some time away from that, but projects like Project Tubin, I think, are moves in the right direction. Being able to exchange money in crypto uh, is a move in the right direction. And obviously, getting regulatory um, approval and getting our regulators comfortable that this is another uh, way to move money, but it's being done with the same controls, the same KYC, the same sanction screening, the same fraud and everything else as we do for real money, I think it's going to go a long way towards getting us there. Yeah, I'm surprised to hear that the 40% number uh, for people still use checks. I can't remember the last time I used a check. I mean, I am a JP Morgan Chase customer. I, for, for It's got to be over 20 years, and I don't think I've written a check in almost 10 years. So it, it sounds as if wholesale payments will eventually be something that can reach the retail user at, at some point, especially you know, with, with a younger generation that are all digital natives. I can't imagine that they'd even be offered a box of checks. That, that, that is exactly right. And that's where we want to get to. But you know, the biggest issuer of checks in this country is the US government. So right. we need to get everyone off of checks in order to get there. But I completely agree with you when you look at millennials and you look at the, the prevalence and proliferation of P2P payments and P2P platforms, that's exactly where the world is going. And I want my business to be able to support 24 by 7 real-time money movements anywhere in the world. With all these projects going live after years of research and pilot testing, both within JP Morgan and the broader financial industry, what excites you the most now and in the next 6 to 12 months? So... Apart from Project Ubin that, you know, we've already talked about, uh, I, I think the thing that excites me the most is the work that we are doing with the e-commerce platforms. Um, and if you think about it, there is probably 10 of them around the world. They each have tens, I mean, 10 very big ones and then a number of smaller ones. All of them have millions and millions of users, in some cases, like billions of users. Uh, and they have incredibly large, diverse and complex marketplaces. And in my business, we have all of the components of how to service those marketplaces. So how do you bring money in, not just credit cards, but also wallets and crypto and everything else? How do you get money out? How do you connect to all of the real-time payment systems and CBDCs in the future that are created around the world? And then how do you allow the, the, the sellers and the buyers in those marketplaces to interact with each other with the currency that the marketplace wants to have and do that in an efficient way and in a real-time way while allowing the marketplace uh, to bring in all of the value-added services that they want. 
That for me is the most exciting thing. Some of it is going to be blockchain and crypto based. Some of it is going to be traditional based. But the scale and size and complexity of being able to serve those clients for me is a unique challenge. And it's a unique opportunity. And it's the thing that we spend most of our time trying to figure out how to make it happen. All right, and um, if anyone has any questions, of course, please compile them in the Q&A. And while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I just want to follow up on something, Takas, that you had said earlier that a lot of these projects are starting out in Singapore. Um, you know, why is Singapore, the island nation of 5.6 million people, the, the place to start these kinds of initiatives? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, some of them do, some of them are in other places, but I think the things that are unique about Singapore are, number one, it's, you know, it's, it's a very open market. A lot of multinationals work there. So therefore, this issue of this multi-currency clearing is much more relevant in Singapore than it would be in a much closed economy. The other thing that I would say is that you have regulators like the MAS that are very forward-looking and want to kind of pave the way for what the future would look like. And then, to be honest, you also have some technologically very savvy players like uh, DBS, which is part of that conversation, that are quite advanced, even among any other bank that you can think of around the world, in terms of how to think about API connectivity, how to think about kind of real-time information exchange. And then all of those things kind of come together in Singapore and therefore make it easy to, to try some of those things and see if they can work. But there are other parts of the world that are also looking at similar things. Uh, I think in Singapore, just everything kind of came together. Right. I would also imagine, too, um, with the infrastructure being newer and not having to worry as much about um, some of the legacy banking systems and legacy central um, bank uh, the way we work with the central banks, the way we work with legacy systems where the infrastructure, it's almost like they've leapfrogged in a, in a way. Um, and I would imagine, yeah. you know, it, it's a great prototype for that, whereas that, those are some of the challenges that we have in the U.S. and EU as an example where we have these legacy systems and assets and, and um, regulations that uh, they have to be integrated. Well, in the U.S., you have 27 countries that need to agree. So that makes everything a little bit more difficult. And in the U.S., as I said, like you have basic problems like check processing and like the lack of availability of any kind of standard government issued digital ID that would facilitate, especially on the retail side, some of these conversations. So I would say a lot of regulators and most central banks around the world are looking at CBDCs, are looking at digital clearing network, but exactly for those reasons, uh, Singapore, I think, is ahead of the rest. Yep, I would agree with you. Um, Gabe, do we have any questions that are coming in? How are we doing on time? Uh, just to take a look at the Q&A here. All right. Actually, we are we are getting a heads up that we are out of time. So you can go all day long talking about fun stuff such as this. Um, Takis, it was a pleasure meeting with you. I hope to meet you on the ground when we're back in New York together and, of course, in Singapore next year. Thank you so much for joining us. And, of course, thank you to um, SFF. MAS, SGX, everyone for um, allowing us the opportunity to participate. Thanks so and much, everyone. Thank Take you care. very much from my side. I know many people stayed up in the middle of the night to organize that. So thank you very much. All right. It's been a pleasure, both of you. Um, thank you once again, Jill. And thank you, Takis, as well. Honestly, he's probably one of the most passionate people I know in a bank that actually when it comes to talking about blockchain. I've never seen anybody that excited talking about blockchain in a bank, looking at you, local banks. Anyway, um, we're very keen to see what the next steps of Onyx are in, you know, and, and you know, with someone who's very deeply involved in the blockchain space, I'm just you know, just glad to hear all these great initiatives. It's actually on that note as well. Very special shout out. Um, if any of you are still watching this on the platform, just take two minutes. Um, go to the online city. At the top right corner, you would see Ubin. And that's where essentially you can find out all the information. You see everything Tarkis has been talking about. Project Ubin, all the content, the partners, the research that's been done. Once again, online city, top right corner, that little island. Think Singapore's a small island, wait till you see Ubin, but very important island. That's where the information is, right? One more panel to go, and um, we'll be right back. We'll be back with you right after this. Thank you.